What you are about to hear is not, 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 not a podcast. <laughs> this is a global conversation recorded live in real time with real people, journalists, business leaders, academics, politicians. I think the term is a deep state. Oh dear. Investors, experts, diplomats, citizens, coming together from around the world to share their views and ask our guests the questions. If you would like to join this conversation or hear our incredible library of past conversations, please visit our website, pm101.club, and join the fastest growing conscious community on the free internet. Thanks for being here. Enjoy. 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 Enjoy the show. The show. The show. The show. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Politics and Media 101 the place where we all hear live and direct from people in the news, in their own voices, in their own words, in long form, and where anyone who wants to can join to ask them a question, share their thoughts, or just listen. I'm Jeff Browning, and I'm grateful to you for being here. Today, we're excited to release part of an interview, conversation, and audience Q&A we had with Laura Rosen, a journalist and leading expert on U.S. policy in the Middle East. Iran is one of the world's oldest continuous civilizations, with settlements dating back over 9,000 years. Today, it's a powerful player in its neighborhood, it controls a sizable natural gas field, and it has been gradually increasing its ability to produce enriched uranium, a material which, depending on its level of concentration, can be used in nuclear power plants or can be used to create nuclear weapons. During the Obama administration years, America and its European allies worked together to put pressure on Iran to come to the table and negotiate limits to its nuclear program. The deal that was reached, known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JCPOA, was not popular in all quarters, but it did contain a plan to impose limits on Iran's ambition to have nuclear material in exchange for economic benefits. Republicans in Congress didn't like that President Obama was doing this, so they passed a law at the time which said that in order to stay in the deal, the president would have to certify to Congress every few months that the deal remained a good one for the U.S.'s national security interest. When President Trump came in, he flipped the script and used this same law to scuttle U.S. participation in the deal. He didn't like that President Obama had negotiated it, many in his base had strong feelings against it, and he said that the U.S. should seek a better deal. A better deal has proven very difficult to achieve. Iran has ramped up its nuclear program since the U.S. backed out of the initial deal. Some have argued that the Obama-Trump flip-flop means that the U.S. itself is less trustworthy and can't be kept to its word. A new civilian government has also come to power in Iran. Against this backdrop, President Biden and his team are doing what they can to advance negotiations, but are facing many challenges. Laura is very knowledgeable about where the negotiations stand at this exact moment. We talked about it in detail. We had incredible audience questions, and we hope you enjoy it as much as we did. As always, if you like or dislike what you hear, if you want to find out how to join us live almost every day of the week, maybe ask one of our upcoming guests a question or hear past episodes, please visit our website, pm101.live or pm101.club. They both work and will get you to the same place where you can find all that and more. Without any further ado, let's roll the tape. Laura, you've been published in dozens of places. You're an essential source for Middle East news. The Obama White House staff even described you as their RSS feed for following events during the original JCPOA talks. Where can the audience who may not be familiar with your work find you? Thank you. Thanks so much for the kind words. Um, So I am, for the past year, I write my own um, pretty much weekly, sometimes twice a week, newsletter that anyone can get um, on Substack. It's called Diplomatic, diplomatic diplomatic.substack.com. And I do try to write a lot on the Iran nuclear negotiations when they're happening and sometimes on other issues as well. I think you saw that um, President Biden's going to speak with Russia's Putin on Tuesday, because the U.S. is also trying to see if they can deter a possible um, future Russian um, invasion of Ukraine. So I've been trying to keep abreast of some other issues in addition to to the Iran one. Yeah, and we actually just had a great talk with a fellow from um, the Carnegie Endowment on Russia's buildup on the border of Ukraine. Laura, I want to get into a little bit about um, the past context, which led to these talks, and then the current talks, and maybe a little bit uh, moving forward. 
But looking back just a tad, when the Trump administration pulled out, pulled the U.S. out of the Iran nuclear deal for the audience, also called the JCPOA, Iran was said to be in compliance with the deal. How has Iran acted since Trump pulled us out of the agreement? And what impact has this had on their breakout time or, i.e., nuclear capability? Great question. So exactly right. When when Trump pulled out in May 2018, Iran had been um, complying with the deal for almost more than two years by then. The deal was uh, was reached in the summer of 2015 and it was um, implemented. The first day of implementation was officially in January 2016. Trump pulled out in 2018. The full U.S. sanctions went back into effect in about um, around now, 2018, November 2018. And Iran waited a full year um, before it decided that it was going to progressively start exceeding the deal's limits, nuclear limits, um, to protest the lack of sanctions relief. So every two months it would take another step. And it was you know, started out as very reversible steps. You know, they were slowly building up the pressure, um, but um, but it wasn't very alarming and it was very methodical. And they were steps that if the parties could ever get back into a deal, like when Biden came into office, they could roll back. Um, but, you know, time over time, um, you know, that starts to accumulate. The, the, the steps they took became more. Um, concerning. Um, Trump administration made no effort to get back to diplomacy with Iran. They um, they never tried to get a better deal. They never used the leverage of the increased sanctions, um, um, you know, to fix the things that Trump said was wrong with the deal. They really kind of drifted into a kind of almost, you know, continuous escalation with Iran. You saw um, you know, skirmishes in Iraq and, and uh, the potential for military action. And often Trump would pull back at the last minute. But they really achieved, Trump really achieved nothing with the added pressure um, in terms of, of getting a better deal or getting around to, re, you know, roll back its nuclear program. Biden comes in in January. It hasn't even been a year. He's careful when he comes in to take a month to consult with the Europeans, to consult with Israel, to consult with Congress, to find out where we are. He's been out of office, you know, for four years um, before he jumps back in. But he he makes clear that his intention is let's get back into this deal that a lot of, you know, Israel, um, a lot of Republicans say is a terrible deal, and then see if we can negotiate the things, um, you know, a, a follow on deal the things that people are concerned the deal didn't achieve. And what happened with the tragedy is that on the Iranian side, um, the Hassan Rouhani president, who'd been a two-term Iranian president, who had kind of staked his administration's foreign policy on engagement with the West, getting a deal, improving Iran's international standing, he was um, facing uh, lame duck status as Iran was going to elections in June, and with no benefits for the Iranians that he could show, um, he really had a very short leash, leash from the Iranian, um, more conservative, non-elected authorities um, to make, you know, get back into the deal. And, and they just ran out of time. They couldn't reach a deal by June. Since June, um, when they had uh, Ibrahim Ra- Raisi, a conservative jurist, became Iran's president. He was inaugurated in August. The Iranians have been saying we need more time to study the negotiations. Um, And they didn't come back to talks until last week. In the meantime, they've really been ramping up their nuclear program. And so people are very frustrated with um, what what they came to the table with last week in Vienna. So I want to hit on those sanctions and the um, maximum pressure. The new administration has been characterized as arch conservative, uh, but we know the real decision making authority rests with the supreme leader Ali um, Khamenei. What difference does it actually make for a new civilian administration to come to power in Iran, considering that uh, all the the authority uh, rests with the supreme leader? And how has it shaped these negotiations? 
That's a great question. And I have to say, my experience on this is only as someone who covers this one issue. I started covering um, in very intensively this around nuclear negotiations when Ahmadinejad was president and the guy who's now the Iran nuclear negotiator, Ali Bagheri, was the deputy negotiator um, under a guy named Saeed Jalili. Um, and Ahmadinejad was president. And this was really when, this was when Obama was president, his at end of his first term around 2012. Um, and, you know, those negotiate. Those negotiators are very similar to the ones that, you know, the parties saw last week in Vienna. They're very skeptical of the West. Um, in, in many ways, um, Trump did everything they, they thought he would, right? They thought, you know, the U.S. would. They thought the U.S. wouldn't keep a deal. Iran will make concessions and the U.S. will just ask for more. Um, in some ways, um, they're, they're very hostile to the West. Um, and in some ways, some of their skepticism has been borne out. The, the past civilian administration, the Rouhani administration, many of their form, uh, you know, foreign ministry people and people in that administration had studied in the West. They had some experience of the United States and Europe. They spoke English, um, were just a little more um, less isolated, more internationally, uh, you know, more sophisticated. Um, and I think they they thought there was a chance for a deal. Anyhow, it's so so it does make a difference in Iran. You're right. They have a the supreme leader. He's extremely hostile to the West, skeptical of a deal. Um, but I think it does make a difference who is the administration in Iran. I think there is some managing up going on by the foreign ministry people when the foreign Iran uh, foreign minister Zarif. Um, I think, you know, when he thought there was a deal to be had, he could try to use that, his experience, to convince people at home to try it, to his bosses, essentially. And I think what the problem is now is you have people who are, first of all, they've been out of power eight years. They hate the other guys. They think they can do such a better job. They think they're much tougher um, and they can, you know, get a better deal by negotiating this way or that way. So that's that's just one human element, right, is the, the new guys come in and they've been wanting to do it their way for eight years. And then, you know, the second element is um, they go back and tell their bosses, you know, I think we should do this. And I don't think these guys um, tend to be pro-compromise. And, and so I'm not sure who's advising Khamenei, you know, you should cut a deal, you know, you should cut a deal or, you know, you're going to get bombed or do you understand what I'm saying? So I think it does make a difference, even though it is uh, a system where um, the ultimate decision maker is the same one when Rouhani was president. No, that is very helpful because the U.S. media and I mean, like mainstream media, when they're covering the Iran deal, they don't really get into any of the nuances of the domestic politics in Iran. So thank you for kind of walking us through that and showing us that it actually does matter. The parties had been engaged in talks in Vienna throughout the year. You said that they may be back at them next week even. Um, and a recent round of negotiations just ended a couple of days ago. Stephen Erlinger, a former guest on the show of The New York Times, wrote that a draft agreement was 70 percent finished this week, but the process is still at risk of collapse. In your view, what's the current state of the Vienna talks? How close or far are we from seeing a deal completed? And is there really any hope that there? So I think there was a big setback last week. What happened is from, from April to June, when it was still um, the Rouhani government um, in Iran in power, um, there were, I think, six rounds of negotiations in Vienna. And they, they got a kind of draft text that I think, as you said, Stephen Erlinger reported was, you know, assessed as being 70 percent of the way there. There were still some gaps. Then they broke for the Iran elections and the new guys didn't come back till last week. And the new guys took the text that was already worked on through six rounds where there were some floated compromises on each side. And what a senior State Department official briefed us yesterday was the Iranians rolled back all the potential Iranian compromises in that text, um, kept all the potential Western uh, concessions in the text and then ask for more. So even though the text may be 
the same length. And it, as the Iranians say, it's based on that draft. You know, they essentially are trying to pocket all of the things that um, all the sanctions the U.S. said would be inconsistent with the JCPOA, not commit to any of the nuclear rollback uh, their predecessor floated and and then ask for more guarantees and things that are, um, I think, politically impossible or very difficult. So the U.S. and the E3, the European three powers in the deal are extremely frustrated. And I think what's even more important is that, um, according to the senior State Department official, the Russians and Chinese were also taken aback by um, how much the Iranian proposal had walked back. So if the I think that um, this new government, this new Iranian government, um, they're used to sort of having hostile relationship, the United States and the E3, the Europeans, but um, they can't... Um, they need the, the Russians and Chinese to sort of um, hold up their points. And I think if the Russians and Chinese, either privately or publicly, um, tell them you're not being serious, these are not serious uh, proposals, um, that will chastise them. OK, so you just laid out how there were six rounds of negotiations under the previous regime. New regime comes in, rolls back basically all of their major concessions. So help me understand this, Laura. Is this part of their negotiation technique, or is this maybe the new regime um, symbolizing and uh, actually uh, telling us that they don't want to actually have? These are such good questions. So is this their negotiating technique? Yes. And simultaneous to waiting five months to get back to the table and then coming with this proposal that, um, you know, is trying to relitigate everything. Um, they've been advancing their nuclear program most critically last week while everyone was in Vienna. Um, Iran has a, an underground um, facility called Fordo, and the IAEA says that they started using advanced centrifuges to do uh, 20 percent enrichment, which is um, higher than the 5 percent for energy use and lower than the 90 percent for weapons grid. Um, but the thing is that that takes their breakout, as I understand, the amount of time it would take Iran to make enough um, highly enriched uranium for one nuclear weapon, which is not the same as helping a nuclear weapon, to about a month currently. And as I understand, if Iran stays on the current trajectory, it could be down to a couple weeks in January. And I think that there we saw an Axios report by Barack Ravid a week or so back that Israel is concerned that the preparations that Iran has been taking at Fordo could be um, preparations for Iran to even do 90 percent higher weapons grade enrichment at Fordo. And um, so my understanding is the U.S. thinks that they could be in the first quarter of next year um, in a period where Iran has could could basically do enough uh, higher enriched uranium for one weapon. And um, and uh, and that's that's problematic. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah and that, that's problematic. And that, that, and um, and uh, do, does this new team want to deal? You know, I don't know. I don't know if they know. Um, um, I don't know. I think that I think they may not know if they want. Yeah, so we just kind of hit the okay. So um, I guess in addition to there being a new regime, in addition to breakout time being shortened for Iran to have a nuclear weapon, what else is different between the JCPOA talks and the current negotiations? Is there some other differences structurally that will make getting a deal this time more difficult than it was last time? And it was very, very difficult to get a deal. So the things that I think would make it more difficult is, one, um, after Trump pulled out of the deal, um, I think it's very hard for the U.S. to negotiate a deal, especially on this issue. But not just this. Think of even the Paris Climate Accord or lots of international deals that Trump ripped up. Um, I don't know if the U.S. can credibly negotiate a deal um, that the other side believes if Republican comes to power um, in three or or nine years, um, the, the other side will hold up. And so that's, you know, that 
um, you know, if, if Iran is negotiating for uh, permanent sanctions relief, right, or if it sticks with the deal and there's permanent sanctions relief, that's one thing. If it thinks it's going to get sanctions relief and then in three or however many years, um, you know, Pompeo comes and, and says, you know, bye bye, um, what is Iran getting out of it? So I do think that is structurally different. Um, in addition, because of the U.S. having pulled out of the deal when Iran was complying, Iran won't let the U.S. sit at the table. That makes it very hard um, for the Europeans to go back and forth um, and say, here's what Iran says, here's what the U.S. says, right? I mean, it just takes longer. Now a lot of these Iranians don't speak English as well as, as the last team. You have to go through translation. You know, even if there was a good faith effort on both sides, even if both sides really wanted it, there's a lot of logistical complications. Austria is having a new COVID lockdown. People are talking through masks. I mean, it's there's it's hard. It's hard. And the other thing is, I mean, this issue has gone down the list of things that the U.S. is most concerned about. It's really, um, you know, I would say maybe in the top five, but you have possibility of Russia moving on Ukraine. Um, you have the U.S. administration really wanting to focus on China as this major power and potential adversary, um, you know, shaping the world and trying to compete with China. You have so many domestic things in the U.S., um, the, the insurrection dealing with the anti-democratic issues in the United States, um, the COVID, continuing COVID, the economy. Um, so anyhow, it just it, it is a very different time. I think a less a less hopeful time um, than when the uh, JCPOA negotiations were being reached. So you we've hit on Trump a little bit, uh, ripping up the previous deal. I want to get into sanctions, but before we get into um, the impact that sanctions have had on Iran, I'm wondering if part of this negotiation, whether or not the Biden administration would be willing to delist the IRGC, which the Trump administration took the extraordinary step of labeling them as a terrorist organization, and also whether or not this is a red line from your reporting uh, from the current uh, Iranian. I honestly do not know. It is a very good question. I um, My understanding is by June, after the six rounds of talks with the last Iranian negotiating team and and uh, the P5 plus one, P4 plus one, plus the U.S. in the other room, um, that of about 1,600 sanctions designations that the Trump administration had done um, in its four years, that there was tentative um, agreement by the U.S. on some 1,000 to 1,200 that it would find inconsistent with the JCPOA. Does that make sense? So, so they were close. You know, they were. It wasn't every single. There were some that were made set sanctions that were designated on terrorism basis or not on the nuclear basis that the U.S. said they were going to keep. But there were a whole lot of sanctions relief that was going to be lifted um, under that tentative deal. The new Iran team comes back and says, "Oh, you have to lift all of them." I'm not sure that's really the deal breaker. Um, of all their maximalist stances, that's the one that I'm least worried about, um, um, you know, because because 1,200 out of 1,600, even, you know, the Raisi administration can understand that that's something that, you know, that's real. The things that are, are more difficult in the talks are what we were discussing a little bit earlier. Iran wants some kind of guarantees the U.S. won't leave the deal again. The U.S. says they can't give that. They can't guarantee who will be president and what they'll want to do. Um, Iran then, I think, wants some way of translating guarantees to grandfathering in the deals um, that might be made during the new nuclear deal. Um, so that, right, if, even if the U.S. pulls out again, those, those deals would be protected. I think there were efforts underway to try to find some creative solutions on that, but that um, there's probably not a whole lot of goodwill going on last week with the Iranians to to work on that, just given what the U.S. is watching Iran do at Fordo. I think they feel like this Iranian team is trying to spring um, nuclear uh, fait accompli on them and say, you know, try to get more concessions. And I think that's turning everybody off. But it seems like, Laura, 
based on what you just said, that ultimately they just want the current Iranian regime is most focused on removing the bulk of economic sanctions. So that stands to reason this question. What's been the impact of the U.S. sanction regime on Iran's economy on a day to day level? What's it been like to live in Iran during this so-called period of maximum pressure that a lot of Iran hardliners and Trump administration officials really praise as the past? Well, I haven't been there. Um, but from what you see um, from people I know and cover and follow, and um, it's been really hard. And um, um But not so hard that I think that um, regime change, you know, I think that there was a kind of unspoken, uh, an unspoken or have spoken policy during the Trump administration that, oh, we'll just, you know, we're not going to negotiate a new deal with Iran. We're just going to squeeze them and squeeze them and squeeze them. And then maybe like the regime will implode and then we'll see. And um, but, you know, that wasn't officially the policy, but I think that might have been unofficially the policy. And, you know, we were kind of cheering on whenever there'd be demonstrations of suffering Iranian people, suffering economic hardship and all that. And you see that even last week or two, you saw um, protests in Isfahan, Iran, over rerouting of a river. They have water shortages, environmental problems. But I just I don't think that. Um, the U.S. can count on regime change. I don't think the Iranian people have a lot of power to change their regime um, necessarily. And um, I don't think we can count on that solving a security issue like the nuclear issue. So I, I, I thought it was terribly mistaken to get rid of an Iran nuclear deal that was working um, for this gamble, to, you know, for this gamble that you'd get a, you know, a new Iranian regime that um, was more amenable to all your security issues. And um, yeah, so that, you know, so yes, there's a, Iranians are suffering. Um, I think that there's a huge amount of um, brain drain. People who can leave are leaving. A lot of the migrant crisis you see in the world, um, you, you see Afghans, you see Iranians, you see Iraqis fleeing, um, trying to get to some place with better economy and and more rights. So I just think it's a terrible situation. And the other thing is, you know, the Iranian regime they use uh, brutality to put down these protests, and um, you know, that's a deterrent that that I think deters a lot of ordinary people from taking to the streets to um, to protest for for better. Yeah. And I, I also wanted to say, ask a, a follow up here. You basically said trying to effectuate regime change maybe is a fool's errand, not to put words in your mouth. Um, but I'm also interested in the concern that many share for the over overuse of U.S. sanctions, pushing countries to innovate, rendering sanctions less effective. Had, to your knowledge, has Iran made progress basically at evading these sanctions? I'm really not a sanctions expert, but my sense is that they are currently selling something like, a, uh, I hope I don't get this wrong, half million barrels a day of oil to, to China, some of it through the UAE, and maybe, um, um, uh, which, is, which is much lower than what they were selling before, but, you know, they, they're... They're surviving, right? So I think probably one of the things we'll see, you know, soon is the U.S. pressing to to close that, and that would that would make things more difficult. I think that that's been a little bit of a given them a little bit of a breathing room, and you know, obviously the U.S. has other issues with China that it wants to deal with, not just Iran. And um, so it's you know, you know, U.S. diplomats talk to the Chinese about buying less Iranian oil, and it's not clear that. Um, uh, until now, until soon, um, that the Chinese have been willing to listen to that, especially because they thought the U.S. was the problem, right? The U U.S. was the reason that um, that China was not, that Iran was not abiding by the nuclear deal. Now I think we're getting to a point where more of the countries are assessing that Iran's actions are the problem. The U.S. wants to get back on the deal, and Iran is not is not serious about that. 
So, 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 and you are absolutely right in terms of, you know, the overuse, you know, you, you use maximum pressure when Iran is complying. Now there's not a whole lot of new things to sanction. Is it, will it be decisive in terms of changing Iran's behavior? I don't think so. I mean, they, I, I, I don't know. There's not a whole lot more to sanction. They can, they can make Iranians suffer more. I know that. Um, will it collapse the regime? I don't know. I don't know. I think Iran thinks they can survive it, that they've gotten through it and they can survive it. And that is affecting very much their calculations, their behavior. Um, speaking of problems with Iran's actions, there's been interest in some quarters in expanding the parameters of a deal with Iran beyond the nuclear program to Iran's aggressive regional activities, such as their support for Hezbollah and Iraq militias, just to name a couple. Uh, some of the sanctions Iran objects to regard to these other topics. Has there been any progress in addressing these matters in the Iran nuclear negotiations, or is that just too much to add into um, such a contentious round of negotiations? So there has been progress, but it's not in the venue of the Iran nuclear talks, which does not include the regional countries. But you've seen like the UAE um, national security advisor is going to Iran tomorrow. Um, I saw the secretary of state Blinken um, on Sunday had a call with the um, uh, crown prince of the UAE of Abu Dhabi. And I'm sure that Iran was the main issue they discussed. And I hope that imagine that Blinken passed a message for, you know, through the national security advisor to send to Iran about the seriousness they need to take, um, you know, how, how, how alarmed the parties are about its behavior. Um, the UAE is having a dialogue with Iran and the Saudis have been meeting with the Iranians in Iraq. That's been suspended recently while Iraq forms a new government, but um, they're, um, there are all sorts of regional talks going on now with Iran that the U.S. is not necessarily directly a part of, but I, I think that there is progress. In, and you've seen the U.S. meantime, Rob Malley's been um, meeting with the GCC countries and Israel. I think they've set up some kind of structure to talk about Iran through the GCC so that they feel more listened to. Um, so I think there's outside of the nuclear deal, outside of the nuclear negotiations. I think they are seriously trying to address some of these regional concerns, um, um, even if the, it's not the, the nuclear talks or the nuclear deal, that's the vehicle for, for dealing with some of those issues. Awesome. I have one last line of questioning for you, Laura. Then we're going to go to the audience, and we'll start with Max and then Rebecca. Um, you've described how, although Israel's Israeli's leadership publicly applauded the collapse of the JCPOA. There's been much more trepidation behind the scenes in Israel. For the audience, they can probably remember Netanyahu really pushing for Trump to rip up the deal. Um, I'm wondering, what do Israeli leaders really think about the collapse of the deal and what it means for Middle Eastern it's Such a, It's really been very, very interesting the last few weeks. And for your listeners, um, the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, which publishes in English, and the Times of Israel, which also publishes in English. They've been doing incredible reporting the past couple of weeks on um, major, you know, former Israeli defense minister, um, former Israeli Mossad chief. Um, I can't remember. I think the IDF chief, uh, Israeli Defense Forces chief, um, getting public interviews saying that, you know, the collapse of the deal, uh, the U.S. leaving the deal was a catastrophe. Everything is much worse now. Um, and, that, and that Netanyahu, when he was cheering on um, Trump leaving the deal, had no plan afterwards for what to do to hold back Iran. And um, so I, you know, I have to say, as someone who tra travels a lot to Israel and, and has a lot of Israeli colleagues and, and friends, and I, I read their reporting as much as I can, and, and who was also covering the Iran nuclear talks, I was always kind of mystified by... Um, what Israel thought was going to happen, right? When the deal left, I mean, it was it was obvious to so many of us that um, it, we would kind of be in a state to similar we were in now. That Iran would um, 
you know, be expanding its nuclear program. And, and it wasn't clear you'd ever get anything better. And this whole idea of a better deal, I thought, you know, if there was a window for that, it was when Trump was threatening to leave the deal. You use the threat, right, to then ask for more and get something. But they just they just gave up. They didn't they didn't pursue that seriously. So um, Israel now, you know, you at the one same time you see a lot of Israeli kind of soul searching about the wisdom of Netanyahu, really, their political leadership, having so agitated against the deal, um, you still see a lot of current Israeli officials traveling to the U.S., traveling to Europe, saying you need to give a military threat to Iran for them to, um, you know, to negotiate more seriously. And they've also been agitating against a possible what, what's called a less for less deal, where we could get if we could get Iran to stop some of their most concerning nuclear activities and give them a little sanctions relief, Israel publicly, their political leaders say they don't want that. So I do think Israel has not fully um, bought into the idea of 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 the basic premise of the Iran nuclear deal, which is they get sanctions relief for, for curbing their nuclear program. And I do think that is a source of some tension between the United States and, and Israel. But it's really much less than it has been, I remember, at the end of the, you know, Obama, uh, Obama Netanyahu time when they were, when, when Netanyahu was so openly um, almost trying to use the U.S. political system against the deal. Yeah, so I kind of wanted to drill in. I guess following up, is there any cohesive Israeli strategy to the Iran nuclear question? What do I mean by that? I mean, in the establishment of national security, um, is there a cohesive strategy? And then following up on that, if there is no Iran nuclear deal and Iran marches towards a nuclear weapon, what is Israel preparing to do? Those are all very good questions. Um, in terms of a cohesive strategy, I'm not sure I'm qu equipped to say, but I mean, what, what I've observed is they want the most pressure possible, economic, um, military threats, diplomatic isolation, um, but that, that some of that is not compatible with the diplomacy you need to get a deal. Because if, let's say, um, I don't know, there, it, it, it's not hard to imagine if there's, let's say, censor at the... Uh, IAEA, or at least until now, um, that Iran wouldn't then say, OK, we're kicking out the inspectors from the IAEA, right? So you get on this escalatory track, which very clearly, you know, to me seems like you're heading towards the kind of um, a, a point where you may have to consider military action. U.S. has really not been interested in having another war in the Middle East. Even Trump, even, you know, Biden, everyone's trying to, to get out of the Middle East. So is the logical progression of, I think, of a lot of what Israel has been advocating is towards either, you know, forcing Iran to surrender, which doesn't seem like they're ever going to do, um, or forcing the U.S. to military action. And um, do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? So I, so I, I think they, but in the meantime, I think they're trying to push everybody to do as much pressure as possible on Iran as they can get out of the West. So um, as they can get the West to, to do Um you know, so yeah, it's a terrible, it's a terrible situation, and they're going to be agitating probably against a, a potential interim deal if that's even feasible. I have no idea if the U.S. is pursuing that or if the Iranians are interested in that. But we're getting pretty close to where they need to, you know, people who support diplomacy are going to want to put time on the clock, and the way you would do that is to have Iran doing less concerning nuclear activities. And so I would think that maybe a less for less deal is something that that would be desirable. Um, and, you know, Israel seems preemptively seems to not want to be giving any sanctions relief, um, uh, doesn't want Iran to be getting any sanctions relief for that. And in terms of Israeli military action, I don't know exactly. Um, I don't think, you know, they, they certainly are saying publicly that they reserve the right to do it. Um, I think they would rather see the U.S. do it if it comes to it. I think there's also the possibility of Israeli covert action sabotage. You've seen that. My understanding is whatever Israel has done, even when it's very, you know, spectacular, takes spectacular, uh, you know, skill, it gets set back very quickly by Iranian 
Iranian game. Iran, you know, when Natanz was sabotaged, then Iran puts in higher centrifuges, more advanced centrifuges and increases its nuclear um, production. So nothing Israel has done through sabotage has been very effective. No, yes, that that is very interesting. I appreciate that. So now we're going to go to the audience. We're going to start with uh, Max, and then we will go to Arizo. Max, over to you. Hi, Laura. Uh, Thank you for coming on. Um, I wanted to touch on what you uh, just mentioned about putting time on the clock for diplomacy. Um, What do you think it would take for Iran to uh, do something that would allow the U.S. and the Europeans to continue to stay at the table and um, try to pursue a negotiation? Um, I I assume that they would have to at least do some kind of pause uh, in their further escalation and, you know, allow IAEA everything they want. But um, is is the U.S. basically willing to to do some sort of goodwill gesture that would get Iran to do that? Those are all good questions. Um, So I think the U.S. early in the Biden administration earlier this year, um, I think that the foreign Iranian foreign minister had floated the possibility of a gesture for gesture of, you know, I don't I don't know if it was unfreezing some bank, you know, some of Iran's money and in, in Asian banks um, for covid vaccines um, in exchange for um, Iran. I think that was when they were just starting to give the IAEA uh, a harder time. Um and then the Iranians basically said, no, no, never mind. At some point, you know, we'll just get to the table and figure out, you know, a deal for both of us to reenter. So so I think then the U.S. shelved, um, shelved the idea of a gesture for gesture. And then I think, you know, it gets harder as Iran is taking more and more provocative steps. And, you know, it seems like it's harder and harder to, to imagine Biden taking a goodwill gesture. Right. Because you just seem like you're rewarding bad behavior. And you're, you know, that's what, not what you want to do. So, but I think if there was a serious um, Iranian willingness to say, stop their 20, suspend their 20% enrichment, um, stop using advanced centrifuges at Fordo, stop their 60% enrichment, then I think that might be worth considering um, some form of sanctions relief, right? Because the, that would seriously put time on the clock. What would it take to get that? First of all, I think the the P5 plus one have to decide, you know, are we giving up on on trying to get back to the JCPOA right now and going for a smaller step? Um, that that would probably come as soon as this week. They're probably getting very close to, you know, that pivot. Um, the other thing I think that I'm hearing from the U.S. and the Europeans is you really need the Russians and Chinese to be helping, um, even if they're not as publicly critical of Iranian stance. Um, behind the scenes, in particular, the Russians um, are very have been very helpful in terms of getting the IAE director general to visit Iran and in terms of telling the Iranians this is not acceptable. For various steps, the Russians tend to be a very good bridge between the U.S. E3 and the Iranians. Um, and in fact, the the Russian the key Russian negotiator in Vienna is a man named Ulyanov. And I noticed that even though he was at the first day of talks last week, and you should follow him on Twitter because he does a good job actually of covering the Vienna negotiations. Um, um, and he obviously gets a lot more access than the U.S. or the journalists. Um, after that Monday, he had another diplomatic commitment in New York and he wasn't there. And I wondered if that was one of the reasons the talks went sideways last week. Um, he should be back in Vienna this week. So I, you know, think he can be effective at trying to salvage things. Um, so and the other thing I was someone was pointing out to me today is that China, um, in addition to not wanting instability that would raise oil prices or, you know, military action that would increase energy prices for their economic expansion, um, China's hosting the Olympics in February. And on the one hand, you have Russia potentially invading Ukraine in January, and you have Iran getting close to the point of having zero break, you know, no time to reach higher level enrichment for a weapon. Um, So China may be incentivized, I think, to not want to have a major 
um, conflict or, you know, nuclear crisis when it's, you know, trying to get prestige hosting these Olympic Games. So I wonder if that is something that will further incentivize trying to get the Chinese um, a little more involved in pressing Iran for um, de-escalation in the coming weeks. Thank you for that question, Max. We will go to um, folks. Remember, this is the Q&A portion. Remain, remain respectful, remain quick, and also wait to be called on. Those are the rules, politics and media 101. But on that note, we will go to Arizo and then we will go to Nas. Thanks, Justin. Um, thanks, John and Jeff. Um, hi, Laura. So um, I just wanted to cover a couple of things. Um, I definitely do believe that Iranians do have the power to change the regime. I think Khamenei is the real decision maker, not Raisi. Um, the human rights abuses are so extensive within Iran. I, I'm just not sure how having this deal is going to be, uh, you know, legitimate, knowing what Iran is doing to its people. Iran does not value its economic prosperity for its own people. Um, we've seen that. Um, Fahiza Rafsanjani in a Farsi speaking clubhouse room has mentioned several times how much money the regime has. So I do believe that the regime was able to provide vaccines and, and, and not allow the sanctions to be effective. Um, my questions for you are, do you think that, um, you know, not having an Iran policy, but only an, a JCPOA policy for Iran will be, um, you know, will be something that we can around the world uh, you know, take into effect as knowing that this is a regime that sponsors terrorism, that violates, cons you know, that violates these terms and that is violating, you know, nuclear terms. So I just I kind of wanted to see your viewpoint on that. I appreciate it. Thank I, you. Respect, and I, know I, I respect thank all you. of your points very much and that Iran is a horrible, uh, horrible human rights record, is main state sponsor of terrorism, you know, um, um, that the Iranian people have um, are suffering more than anybody else from the decisions of the regime. Of course, I agree with you. I mean, you're deferred to your expertise on who makes decisions in Iran. I accept that it's Khamenei. Um, and um, I feel badly for the Iranian people. I do not think that the Iran nuclear deal... I, look, I think that the U.S. has to make decisions for the U.S. national security. And um, this goes with with every country, right? And I think for the U.S. national interest, Iran not having a nuclear weapon is the number one goal of, of all these things. Even though they care about Iranian people's human rights, um, that is not the number one national interest of the United States with regards to Iran. And I do not think that having an Iran nuclear deal um, means that the U.S. likes this Iranian regime. I don't think it makes this, I, I don't know. I don't think that it, I think it, what it, for the U.S. perspective, it it <laughs> prevents Iran from getting a nuclear weapon and, you know, hopefully prevents the U.S. from having to get involved in another war in the Middle East. And, um, and hopefully it puts a little more money um, in middle class people in Iran's pocketbooks so that they have more, they're more empowered. It seems like they're the least empowered by the situation now where, as you point out, the regime may have money. It clearly has money for its nuclear program. It has money for weapons. It has money for sponsoring terrorism. But it's ordinary people that are suffering, you know, oppression, human rights abuses, and, and surely, you know, economic hardship. So I, I just don't see how the Iranian people benefit um, from the current, from the status quo at all. I don't see how they benefited from Trump pulling out of the deal and reimposing sanctions on them and then cheering them on, like, have a nice time at your demonstrations. You know, I think that was a lot of cheap talk and it didn't do anything to, um, to make anything better for the Iranian people. So thank you for that question and answer. We will go to Nas and then John Gunnison. Nas Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Laura. Uh, wonderful job. Uh, my question is, are we heading towards a nuclear arms race in the region or towards a comprehensive uh, treaty for free nuclear in the Middle East, a greater Middle East? Because clearly there are other countries will not accept nuclear Iran or nuclear Israel, for that matter, especially Turkey, Egypt, Saudi Arabia. So... Wouldn't be to the best interest of the region and the international community to have a nuclear treaty, comprehensive nuclear treaty for the entire region? Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
you know, I used to tune into that issue more and then um, I kind of tuned out. Um, I don't see Israel um, being so interested in that. And um, I think the U.S. relations with Israel right now, it's, they have other um, fish to fry. They're not, U.S. isn't going to push Israel to give up its nuclear um, program. Um, you know, I think the question now is, Iran is pretty close to having military nuclear capability. Um, I think that there probably will be a decision point in the next few months of whether there would have to be some kind of military action to um, to target its fissile material if it's um, getting towards 90 percent enrichment or making moves. Um, I think that decision point is coming pretty soon. Um, I, I don't think that Biden plans to let Iran get a nuclear weapon if he can stop it. I think the real fear is that Iran could be in sort of the state that North Korea was in the late 90s when it had enough high enriched uranium for a couple of bombs, but it happened, ha had not weaponized yet. And um, and then when diplomacy collapsed, it, you know, it started producing nuclear weapons. I think it, Iran is close to the decision point um, where its calculations when it, you know, over a deal, over a de between a deal and diplomacy versus uh, having a nuclear weapons program, I think that point is coming pretty soon. Thank you for that question, Nas. We will go to Mr. John Gunnison, a co-founder of this club, and then we will go to Amit. John, over to you. Thank you very much, Laura. And like Nas, I have a question that's sort of about the Arab role and all of this. Um, as you mentioned, there's been this really interesting increase in diplomatic activity between the Arab countries and Iran, something that was unthinkable just a few years ago. We've had those talks in Baghdad that you mentioned between Iran and Saudi Arabia. We've had the recent flurry of activity between my former home country, the UAE, and Iran, including the visits that are going to be happening this week in Tehran. Um, I'm interested in what is the thinking behind the Arab leadership. If um, this is, as Hussein Ibish suggested, a pro forma show of good faith, to demonstrate that the Arab countries are willing to talk to Iran, uh, to, to demonstrate that they're not interested in uh, more aggressive escalation, to show their goodwill to the West? Or if there's really substantive gains here, if there's really been a huge change of thinking on the Arab side, we know that there's been an increase in focus on the economy, especially since January, and a turn away from some of the more national security focused thinking. Uh, what do you think is really driving this activity? Um, do you see it as a genuine interest in um, progressive uh, diplomatic gains that have seen substantive uh, practical um, achievements? Or do you see it more as going through the motions and demonstrating a willingness to talk, although the real thinking has remained similar to how it has in the past? That was a great question. And you probably have more expertise on the Arab point of view. I mean, my sense is like the Saudis, I think, have been fairly um, public that they haven't... Um, felt like they've achieved much substantively from the talks with Iran and through the good offices of Iraq. Um, but um, and I don't think they were doing it at the behest of the United States. I don't think they were reaching out. I think that probably Trump administration wasn't very interested in them talking to Iran. So they you know, but they saw Biden coming and they and they I think they're doing it for their own interests. You know, you um, you, you can fight and talk. I mean, and they I think that they are trying to. Um, see if talking to the Iranians advances their interests while, you know, I know the Saudis are very concerned about Iranian support for the Houthis in Yemen and the Houthis um, shooting missiles into Saudi Arabia, into their territory. So I think they're looking for multiple tools like, like every country does to try to um, protect their to protect their countries. I think that's why they're doing it. Um, UAE, um, I, it's very interesting. UAE really seems to have been trying to take the role almost that Oman did a few years ago during the Obama administration as kind of the peacemaker that you saw that the um, crown prince went to Turkey recently. They sent which official, which UAE official went to uh, Syria recently to see about de-escalating with Assad. He, who was that? The foreign minister? Um, Garwash, Anwar Garwash. I'm not oh, sure. Was, um... I can't remember. You're right. And then the, the national security advisor is, is going to Iran tomorrow, as you mentioned. I do think that I would hope that the U.S. is using um, 
that person as a conveyor of messages as well. I'm sure it's not exclusively on conveying U.S. messages, and there are other ways to do that. But I would I would hope that is one of the ways the U.S. is passing on messages. Um, um, so I think so. I, I'm not sure that all the Arab countries have the same have the exact same agenda. Um, in terms of talking with Iran, I think the Saudis are probably the most skeptical. UAE seems to be doing a lot of maybe what more of what you're saying of trying to show um, the region its role, trying to, I don't know, de-escalate things. The UAE was at the forefront of the Abraham Accords of normalizing relations with Israel, um, which the Israelis are really very enthusiastic about. So, I mean, it's, it's really very fascinating that UAE is... is um, is is increasing the level of its relations with all these enemies, you know, all these countries that are that are hostile to each other at the same time. And it's fascinating. Thank you for that question, Mr. Gunnison. We will go to Amit and then we'll go to my son. Amit over. Thanks, Justin and John. And hi, Laura. This is Amit in Chicago. Um, hi, thanks for your time today. So we agree on a couple of things. Like, I think that um it's probably asking too much for the regime in Tehran, as horrific as it is, to be replaced. Um, I think that um, we both agree that we want a prosperous Iranian people and, you know, more, I guess, bread on the table for the Iranian middle class. Um, I've been following you for, I don't know, since 2009 or 10 or something like that. And and generally speaking, like, we disagree on just about everything else. Um, so I, I, I don't want it to seem like I'm setting up, like, a gotcha here or anything. Um, you know, it's all respect. But, like, honestly, when we're talking about sanctions and JCPOA, it's, it's really, I think what it boils down to is money for the Iranian regime and, um, and the ability for them to develop nuclear capabilities in exchange for... Um, assurances to the rest of the world that they won't drop a nuke on any number of suspecting countries. So, but that um, seems like the outcome that that was achieved by quitting the nuclear deal. I mean, that that that's a straight line from quitting the nuclear deal to Iran getting as close to we've ever been to having nuclear capability. Um, and so, you you if 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 uh, I think that. You know, that, that's my I just think you have to just look at the results when when the deal was being implemented. Iran's, you know, had a one year breakout. Now we're down to one month. Um, so that is a direct result of Trump leaving the deal. So and and nothing's, you know, I, I don't know. So anyhow, okay. is there is there a question? Yeah. Yeah. So so my question, um, I mean, I know that you were on Twitter in 2018 trying to set up what you called the groundwork of this narrative that Trump. Um, messed up the JCPOA, and and you seem to be continuing to go with that. I'm I'm wondering, where are you going to hold the the regime in Tehran accountable for for their oh, part? I, oh, I think that you know the pivot is underway. Look, the, you know, I think Trump was wrong to leave a deal that was working for for what it was supposed to achieve. Um, I am disappointed that Biden administration did not move more quickly um, to try to get back in the deal when you had people in power in Iran um, who were invested in that. I think now we have people in Iran, maybe you'll be happy for, you know, for at least four years who um, don't seem capable of negotiating a deal or may not be capable of negotiating a deal. So um, um, th there's different people responsible for it, but, you know, now you have people in Iran who seem to be wanting to increase their nuclear program and seeing if they can get the West to give them more concessions. And you could end up very quickly with a North Korea type situation where, you know, maybe they didn't want a bomb a few years ago, but now they think like, we're not going to get a deal. You know, we're not satisfied with this deal. So we're going to go for a nuclear weapon that doesn't do anything to solve um, the hardships of the Iranian, you know, ordinary Iranian people. So, yeah, and I will blame, you know, I think that there's a lot of blame to go around. So certainly I blame the Iranian leadership for that. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, the, the Trump administration, Trump specifically did a stunning amount of damage to U.S. credibility on the international uh, stage with a lot of their actions, especially pulling out of this agreement. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that, Laura. We're going to go to one more question. Um, we will go to uh, Shane for the last question, and then I will send it to Laura for final words. But Shane, Thanks. Uh, so I was curious. Um, to me, it sounds like the majority of the frustration is folks concerned about lost time with Trump. 
Um, and so does that mean that there might be a possibility of going back to a previous iteration uh, moving forward? Back to um, the deal. That's what they've been trying to. So that's what the um, the six countries in Iran have been in Vienna um, during the spring and then starting again last week to explore is basically um, what get, to try to get an understanding of what the U.S. would do in terms of lifting sanctions and what Iran would do in terms of rolling back its nuclear program to get back to the old deal. And I think that is still the senior State Department official gave a briefing yesterday and said that's still the U.S. preference. But I think that, you know, after the experience last week with the um, a not serious Iranian proposal, according to the United States, um, I think they're starting to prepare for a world where they don't believe Iran wants to go back. Thank you for that question, Shane and Ansel. Laura, I want to thank you very much, Laura, for spending um, over an hour with us so far today. And I want to leave you um, with the last question that we leave all our guests with. What do you want to leave everybody with? It could be on Iran, Israel, U.S. It could be on the nuclear negotiations. It could be positive negative or somewhere in between. What are what are your last words for? Oh, my goodness. I, I wasn't prepared for this. I'm so um, tunnel f- uh, vision focused on this. You know, I would look for um, a first quarter of the year um, where really the U.S. is managing an extraordinary number of difficult things, including you see Biden's going to be talking with Putin on Tuesday about seeing if there's a diplomatic off-ramp um, over the disagreement on Ukraine, which is problems with Ukraine. Um, you see the U.S. trying to work with Russia and China and the E3 um, and Israel and the Gulf on trying to persuade Iran to be reasonable to get a nuclear deal. You see China um, going to be hosting Olympics in, in February and, and the U.S. thinking about um, can, can China's desire for there to be calm at that time be one of the incentives for China to be more active in the negotiations with Iran in the coming weeks to try to get Iran to um, maybe roll back some of its most concerning behavior? So um, that, those are some of the issues I'm looking at. That is all we have for you today. Again, huge thanks to Laura for coming out, to our audience for their great questions, and to you for being here. If you like or dislike what you hear, if you want to find out how to join us live almost every day of the week, maybe ask one of our upcoming guests a question, please visit our website, pm101.club or pm101.live. They both work and will get you to the same place where you can find all that and more. This has been Politics and Media 101, produced in partnership with Clubhouse. I'm Jeff Browning. On behalf of Justin Higgins, our co-founder and our team, thank you very much for being here. We hope to see you and hear from you soon.